most happy living here below. I thought that I could make it walking on my own, but then the Spirit whispered, friend, there's so much more. So I gave my heart to Jesus. He gave a peace like never before. I didn't know that I was carrying a heavy load until the load that I was carrying was gone. I didn't know I'd have the strength to walk the narrow road until the narrow road I started walking on. I didn't know the peace, the joy deep down inside, the sense of pure release until he opened up my eyes. Cause I didn't know that I was carrying a heavy load until the load that I was carrying was gone. Friend, you may be happy and fully satisfied. As long as life is easy, you're rolling with the tide. But at the sign of trouble, oh friend, where will you be? Won't you give your life to Jesus? Then you can say with me. I didn't know that I was carrying a heavy load until the load that I was carrying was gone. I didn't know I'd have the strength to walk the narrow road until the narrow road I started walking on. I didn't know the peace, the joy deep down inside, the sense of pure release until he opened up my eyes. Cause I didn't know that I was carrying a heavy load until the load that I was carrying was gone. I didn't know that I was carrying a heavy load until the load that I was carrying was gone. I didn't know I'd have the strength to walk the narrow road until the narrow road I started walking on. I didn't know the peace, the joy deep down inside, the sense of pure release until he opened up my eyes. I didn't know that I was carrying a heavy load. Jesus lived a perfect life and no one else ever has. I believe that he died on a rugged cross to pay for all my sin. I believe that early on the third day, my Savior rose again. I believe. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
when this life is but a memory, God's Word will still stand. From Genesis to Revelation, yes, Lord, I believe that your Word is sure, your love is pure, your grace I now receive. The two words of my heart, the two words of my heart, the two words of my heart, Lord, I Jesus Christ my King, and though I'm growing weary, His message still I sing. He is my rock of ages, and on His word I'll stand, till I get home to Beulah Land. Lord, lead, Lord, lead me, on me on to blessed Beulah Land, where, where I, I shall join, shall join that happy, happy angel band. Well, I'm shouting praise to Jesus, while holding to His hand. Lord, lead, Lord, lead me, me to Beulah Land. The battle still is raging, the end is now in sight. The lights of heaven city break through the gathering night. My fight for right is ending, so take my trembling hand. Lord, lead me on to Beulah Land. Lord, lead me on to blessed Beulah Land. Where I shall join, shall join that happy angel band. Well, I'm shouting praise to Jesus while holding to his hand. Lord, lead, Lord, lead me, on me on to Beulah Land. Lord, lead, Lord, lead me, on me on to blessed Beulah Land. Where I, where I shall, join shall join that happy angel band. Well, I'm shouting praise to Jesus while holding to his hand. Lord, lead me on to Beulah Land. Lord, lead, Lord, lead me, on me on to blessed Beulah Land, where, where I, I shall, join shall join that happy angel band. Well, I'm shouting praise to Jesus while holding to his hand. Lord, lead me on to Beulah Land. Lord, lead me on to Beulah Land. Lead me on to Beulah Land. Father above, who is nearest and dearest. 
was once my home, I was a slave. Helpless and sin did roam, the blind did crave. But when I looked up to heaven's dome, Christ came to save. I'm living in Canaan, living in Canaan now. Living on Canaan's side, Egypt behind. Crossed over Jordan wide, gladness to find. My soul is satisfied, no longer blind. Living with Jesus up in Canaan right now. Down in the lowlands, drear, burdened with sin. My soul was filled with fear, darkness within. But Christ the Savior to me drew near, my heart to win. I'm living in Canaan, living in Canaan now. Living on Canaan's side, Egypt behind. Crossed over Jordan, my gladness to find. My soul is satisfied, no longer blind. Living with Jesus up in Canaan right now. Satan may have you bound with fetters strong. Look up to higher grounds, will not be long till Christ the Savior your soul has found. You'll sing this song, I'm living in Canaan, living in Canaan now. Living on Canaan's side, Egypt behind, crossed over Jordan wide, gladness to find. My soul is satisfied, no longer blind, living with Jesus up in Canaan right now. My soul is satisfied. My soul is satisfied. My soul is satisfied. No longer blind, living with Jesus up in Canaan right now. Living in Canaan now. That the Bible is true I'm here to tell you It's only because I've come through enough To see what faith does Faith sees the invisible Believes the impossible Receives the incredible No matter what was Faith moves the unmovable Proves the unprovable For anyone willing to trust if there's a mountain that stands in your way From all you can see it will be there to stay God said with the faith of a small mustard seed That mountain will move, believe and you'll see Faith sees the invisible, believes the impossible Receives the incredible, no matter what was Unmovable proves the unprovable for anyone willing to trust. Believe and you'll see what faith does. Believe and you'll see. Just believe and you'll see. Faith sees the invisible, believes the impossible, receives the incredible, no matter what was. Faith moves the unmovable. Good morning and welcome to the broadcast from Friendship Baptist Church. We're thrilled that you could join us this morning and I feel like every week we're getting a little bit better with the way that we're broadcasting and letting you hear God's word and probably by the time we get to meet again is when I will be most satisfied with the way the recording is going but I am glad that we have the technology to send out a, a message for you this morning. We're going to have Brother Ray. He's going to give us our Sunday school lesson 
over in the other room where we usually do Sunday school for the adult class. And then we're going to follow that by some special music in our morning worship service and announcement time. We're glad that you could join us this morning. Let's, before we start, get, uh, go to the Lord in prayer before Brother Ray's message. Lord, I ask you to just strengthen our hearts today. Help us to be able to put distractions aside and help us to worship you where we are. Maybe in our front rooms, our different areas where we're just sitting together or by ourselves, Lord, wherever we might be. I ask you to just help us to focus on you and your word this morning. I ask you to strengthen our hearts in you. And I know right now there's a lot of people who are lonely and full of anxiety and just struggling with so much. God, I ask you to strengthen them. Help us to reach them and help them to know that you care so much. Comfort hearts like only you can today. We ask all these things in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. So good to come and be with you again this morning. We're so thankful for what all God has done for us this past week and the prospects of being able to again attend our house of worship together and uh, be able to speak face to face and be able to teach the book again face to face but what a joy, what a joy it's been to be with you these weeks via the uh, uh, website and the video on the camera. It's just been good. And I trust that God has been blessing you and strengthening you and helping you uh, throughout these days. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for the privilege we have to gather together again this day. I pray thy blessings upon every family that's able to uh, gather with us and tune in. I pray thy blessings upon them, their family, their extended families. Dear Father, if there's anyone that's in the family or extended families of our church family that does not know thee as Lord and Savior, I pray, Father, that somehow, some way, through the Word of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, the witnessing of of each one that hears the messages and all of us working together, they might come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity I had today to uh, encourage a man who had accepted thee but didn't think he was able to keep his salvation. And I was able to take thy word, Lord, and show uh, him that you never let us go. You never uh, cast us out. Once we've accepted you, we're never cast out. We can't get out of thy hand. we got everlasting life. Now, thank you, Father, for that. <clears throat> I pray that you'll help us as we uh, finish up our lessons today in, in the life of Samson. And I pray, Father, that you'll help us to realize that uh, Samson never did anything but what any Christian can do if they get away from thee. I pray that you'll help us now to glorify thee and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, give thee the praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Bible's open today to Judges chapter number 16. And we'll begin with verse number 1. Now this chapter in my Bible is entitled, The Death of Samson. Now verse 20 we have, uh, at chapter 15, that he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. Now we'll find that out again at the end of this chapter. But in all the other judges, God never ever uh, said they judged the, uh, uh, the amount of years they judged Israel until they died. And so that uh, tells me that God had uh, taken Samson and had uh, taken away the judgeship from Samson at this time. <clears throat> and that uh, it also points up the fact that... Uh, we as uh, his uh, children uh, can also have our main responsibility uh, taken away from us and we can uh, uh, become a uh, castaway or cast off. And that was Paul's greatest fear that that would happen to him after he had preached to others that he'd be set on a shelf and not able to preach again. I'll, I'll never will forget one of my good, good friends in Bible college also worked together in the church when I first came back here. And uh, uh, he, uh, he, he messed up in his life in a moral manner. And uh, several years later, 10, 10 years later, 15, I, I contacted him. And he had straightened everything out and was, was going to church. And he's a good Bible teacher. And I said, uh, 
why don't you uh, get back in and start teaching again? And he said, no. He said, God has set me on the shelf. He said, I've, I've, uh, I've uh, wasted my, these last few years of my life that I've wasted because of the decisions that I made. And that can happen. And I, I don't want it to happen to any of you, and I don't want it to happen to me. But anyway, we have here the uh, 16th chapter, verse 1. Then went Samson to Gaza, and saw there an harlot, and went in unto her. And it was told the Gazites, saying, Samson is come hither. And they compassed him in. And they laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city, and were quiet all the night, saying, in the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. Oh, they were trying their best to get rid of Samson. <clears throat> Samson was a thorn in their side. Had Samson done what God wanted him to do, the nation of the Philistines would have been destroyed. They would have been taken out. Samson could have gathered together the children of Israel, and with the power of God upon him uh, and uh, leading in the fight, uh, the Philistines would never have had a chance. Every time they confronted Samson, they didn't have a chance. Not as long as Samson uh, had uh, uh, the Nazarite vow upon him. Well, they planned. But God, I think it was the Lord, verse 3 says, uh, And Samson lay till midnight. And arose at midnight. Now he'd gone into a harlot, sin, wrong. And, but he arose at midnight, and he took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts, and went away with them, bar and all, and put them up on his shoulders, and carried them up to the top of a hill that was before Hebron. Now if you'll check that out in a map, you'll find that he carried those gates somewhere between 25 and 30 miles. And uh, those gates would weigh no less than 1,800 to 2,000 pounds. And so even here, as the Philistines thought to kill him, he was awakened at midnight, got up, gates were locked, but what about those guards that were out there? How many of the Philistines, the Gazites, were out there? They compassed him in. Kind of reminds me a little bit of how they tried to uh, make sure that nobody stole the body of our Savior. They set a garrison of soldiers around that tomb. Roll that big two-ton rock on top of that door of that tomb. Sealed it and set a garrison of Roman soldiers around it. I think about 120. Now, was there 120? in the number of these Philistines that compassed that gate about and laid wait to catch Samson when he came out in the morning? I don't know. But I do know that if Samson took the gate, these soldiers woke up and Samson had to kill all of them uh, and wipe them out and then take the gate and the post and the two gates and carry them on his shoulders up to the top of that hill. That was before Hebron. The power of the Spirit of God was upon him even at this time. Very, very amazing. Had he done right? No. But the Nazarite vow was still intact in the fact that he had never cut his hair. Had never had a pair of clippers or a razor come to his head. We look at verse 4. There's a paragraph mark there. And it said, it came to pass afterward, how long we don't know, that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. It's kind of interesting. Samson grew up home with his mom and dad. He dwelled among a people that he was appointed as judge over by God Almighty. And he liked a woman down in Timnath because she pleased him well. He ended up going into a harlot and never one time did he ever have recorded that he loved anybody but himself. He didn't say he loved himself, but his actions showed that. He uh, followed his own revenge. He followed his own lust. 
He did what he wanted to. He went where he wanted to without any seemingly an emotional attachment to his mother, father, or his countrymen. And yet, when it comes to this woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah, the Bible says that he loved her. He loved her. Oh, man. Satan had done his best in many ways to destroy Samson. He did his best to get him slaughtered, to get him killed, and it always turned backwards. And it was always against the enemies that Satan had brought against him. But here, Satan gets a hold of his flesh. And one of the things we found out about strong men is that they have trouble with intimacy. And evidently, this was the first and only woman that he ever really felt intimate with in his heart. He loved her. You know, the Bible says that Demas forsook the Lord because he loved the pleasures of this world. He loved the uh, things that Satan put before him. And so... We find that if Satan can get a hold of our emotions and our heart and our desires, he can pretty well lead us to our destruction. How many good Christians have been destroyed? Young people, men, women, husbands, and wives have been destroyed because of the lust of the flesh growing into an intimate, personal love, emotional love, lust, whatever, that tied them to that which destroyed them. Verse 5, And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him, and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And we will give thee, every one of us, eleven hundred pieces of silver. Ha, it is so, it is so interesting. There were five lords, which were princes, of five major cities in Philistia. They were, one of them was the head of Gaza, a town. Another was the head of Ashdod. Another was Eshkelon, and Gath, and Ekron, and uh, that, that was it, five of them. And we find that in Joshua 13.3. And so uh, it's interesting that the five princes, the five cities are named in Joshua 13, which 13 is a number of rebellion, chapter 13. And then we find five. Now, we, uh, in the Christian realm, many times five is, is, uh, is tied with grace. And they get that from uh, the five wounds of Christ on the cross the crown of thorns and, and the, uh, the uh, hands and feet nailed, pierced, and the side, the sword pierced his side. Five wounds on the cross, and so they have a tied that with grace. But five is not really tied with grace. Even then it was death because Jesus bowed his head and gave up the ghost on the Calvary's cross. And so five is a number of death. Always the number of death. And uh, we find that the first man who is recorded as having died is found in Genesis 5, verse 5. Genesis chapter 5, verse 5. We found that Ananias and Sapphira, the Christians that were slain for lying, to the Holy Ghost and to God was in chapter, in Acts, chapter number 5. And then we find that Adam's sin that brought about death was exposed and recorded in Romans chapter 5 and verse number 12. And now you want you to notice something else here. It says that every one of those uh, lords, those princes, brought her 1,100 pieces of silver. 
You multiply that by the time by five, well, you find that it was 5,500 pieces of silver. It's kind of interesting. They were going to think that they were going to save their lives by enticing her to uh, uh, find out where Samson's strength was. They'd, they recognized that it wasn't normal, and they couldn't find out where his strength was. And so they enticed her, verse 5, with 5,500 pieces of silver, and they were going to kill him, and they were going to live. So verse 6, a paragraph, Mark says, And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. Well, now, she told him straight up what she wanted to find out for. She said, I, I, want, I want to find out so that you might be able to get afflicted. And Samson said unto her, If they bind me with seven green withs that were never try, dried, then I shall be weak and be as another man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven green withs which had not been dried, and she bound them with them. Now there were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber. And she said unto them, unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he brake the withs, as the thread of tow is broken when it is touched the far, toucheth the fire. So his strength was not known. Now, Samson, he, he, he got his eye off the big picture, of course. Samson was full of ego. He thought he was invincible. He uh, uh, had trouble with intimacy, and, and somehow, some way, Delilah had, uh, in, had uh, brought about a feeling of intimacy with him that he was willing to take chances with her that he took with no one else. And so uh, she began to pressure him to tell what the uh, base of his strength was. And uh, so he began to tease her. He began to play with her again, thinking he was, he was so smart. Verse 10, And Delilah said unto Samson, Behold, thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou mightest be bound. Now you'll notice that uh, he had said seven. He revealed part of his secret. Seven. We'll see that a little bit later. And uh, then uh, he, he said this, uh, that in verse number 11, and he said unto her, If they bind me fast with new ropes that never were occupied, then shall I be weak and be as another man. And so she, uh, Delilah therefore took, uh, took new ropes and bound him therewith and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And there were liars in wait, abiding in the chamber, and he brake them from off his arms like a thread. He just, he just teasing her and showing her his strength and proud of himself and one thing and another. But Satan is very, very subtle, and he's, he's got him. He loved her. He loved her. And Delilah said unto Samson, Hitherto hast thou mocked me and told me lies. Tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web. Seven locks. See, it's getting closer. Satan is getting close, getting down closer and closer for his strength to be removed. Seven locks. <clears throat> and she fastened it with the pen and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awake out of his sleep, and he went away with the pen of the beam and with the web. My, he just gets up. He goes again. Now, okay, three times, three times, She's told him that she wants to find out the strength so he can be bound. She wants to find out his strength so she can bind him. That's what she's told him. And, huh, but here it comes, verse 15, paragraph. She said unto him, 
how canst thou say, I love thee? There it is. As far as we know, Samson had never told anybody he loved him. Never. But here he loved this woman, Delilah, and he had no doubt told her many times. And as they would uh, fellowship together, do whatever they did and all that, he would say many times, I love you. I love you. She said, How canst thou say I love thee when thine heart is not with me? You're just saying it. Your heart's not in it. You know, a lot of people mouth to the Lord they love him, but their heart's not there. Jesus said they honor me with their mouth, but their heart is far, far from me. And so what Delilah had done, she had gotten his heart. She had gotten his heart. Satan, through her wiles, had gotten into Samson's heart, and she was able to manipulate him because she had his heart. You know, uh, wherever your heart is, your treasure, there will be your treasure also. And so... Uh, she, she got to his heart. Thou hast mocked me these three times and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words. Samson, you don't really love me because you've never told me your strength. Oh, I love you, Dalala. I love you. No, you really don't. No, I, I love you. Okay, Samson, I know you love me. Back and forth, all of that. And she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. She had broken through that hard exterior that had surrounded him to where nobody meant anything to him. She did. She did. Satan is very powerful, wiser than any person that's ever lived other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, was enticed by Satan and worshipped other gods. My, with all the wisdom that he had. Thomas, a semicolon, verse 17. Then he told her all his heart and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God, from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak like any other man. Oh boy, he did spill it. He told it all. And there's something he put here that they'd never heard, that he had a Nazarite vow unto God. Now, the Philistines began to think, oh, God, he, this must be his inner soul because gods were very important to them. Dagon was very important to them. And so when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines, saying, come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her, and brought money in their hand. Ha! Ah! Before, there were just Philistines accompanying her. But now, the lords came. And they brought the money, put it into her hand. And so, she has the money. So, she made him sleep upon her knees. And she called for a man. And she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began, she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. I don't know exactly uh, uh, how that word afflicts. Some people think that she began to slap him around and beat on him and, and ah, you know, let her vengeance come out on her hatred. She didn't love him. She hated him. But I'm thinking that maybe through Satan, she was afflicting him because she helped the guy cut his hair, would hold it up while he cut it and 
helped him cut it off. She began to afflict him and take away the strength of God from off him and cause the Nazarite vow to be temporarily removed from him. And that's what happened. And uh, verse 20, she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as other times before and shake myself. And he wished not that the Lord was departed from him. Oh, boy, what a price he paid for defilement. What a price he paid for a wicked life. What a price he paid for vengeance and lust and defiling himself with dead bodies and with harlots and with, with uh, 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 deceitfulness and with pride and with showing off and one thing and another. And now then, payday had come home. People can get away with a lot of things. Talked with a man today and, and uh, he uh, was telling me that uh, he was having all kinds of trouble and one thing and another and it was obvious that he was, he was homeless. And he began to, uh, it didn't, didn't make a, uh, couldn't make a lot of sense. But in, in the whole context of everything that he was telling me, I saw a man who had gone his own way, lived his own life, lost family, lost children, lost job, lost home, lost everything, and, uh, and because of a lifestyle. And now you find here in verse 21, paragraph mark, but the Philistines took him and put out his eyes, put out his eyes. Well, the eye gate, every, every uh, sin we commit comes through a pride of life, the lust of the flesh, or the lust of the eyes. The eye gate. And that's what started it down the wrong road. I saw a woman in Timnath. Well, he shouldn't have been down there messing with a woman in Timnath. He should have been figuring out how to fight the Philistines and deliver his uh, kin, kinward, kinward kindred from the uh, oppression of the Philistine. Now, his eyes got him in trouble. And the Bible says here that uh, uh, he, he went down to, uh, to uh, the valley of Sorek and he loved a woman by the name of Delilah. He saw her. He saw her. And they put out his eyes, burned them out, and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass and he did grind in the prison. Oh, I'll tell you what. They, uh, they uh, thought they had him. We've got Samson now. We'll make fun of him. How, how uh, lost people like to humiliate and uh, demonize or... Uh, down, downgrade Christians, uh, even those that are alive, living right, especially those that slip and get, get away from God and, and began to uh, do things that they ought not to do and that the world does and so forth. They put out his eyes. And uh, they uh, bound him with brass. Verse 22, how be it? How be it? the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. Now, Christian, if you've gotten off the track, if you've gotten off uh, what God wants you to do, I want you to know that if you would get back and get down on your face before God and your knees or bow your head and sit down at a table or whatever, open the Bible and ask God to forgive you, and ask God to cleanse you from all your sin. And call all the sin that, that uh, he wants to deal with back to your mind. Call it to your remembrance. And uh, that uh, you can lay it, on the, lay it out before him. And ask his forgiveness. Why uh, uh, the Holy Spirit will begin to uh, strengthen you again. Will begin to help you again. And will begin to prepare you again. And to, to give you victories again. 
and to use you again in God's precious service. But his hair began to grow again after he was shaven. Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for, the, for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their God, and to rejoice, for they said, Our God, little g, hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. Now verse 24 and verse 25 seem to be chronologically out of balance, because in verse 24 it says, And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, Our God hath delivered into our hands our enemy and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. He'd, he'd killed many of them. He had, a, he had a real reputation. And our God, Dagon, he's delivered Samson into our hands. No, 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 it wasn't. It wasn't uh, Dagon. It was uh, God allowed him to be delivered into their hands. And it came to pass, uh, when the people saw him, they praised their God. And uh, verse 24, verse 25, And it came to pass, when their hearts were merry, that they said, Call for Samson, that he may make us sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house. They made him do humiliating things. They made him do humiliating things. What they didn't notice was that his hair had begun to grow. I don't know exactly what may have happened in that, in that uh, uh, grinding house where they had him tied to that wheel that ground the grain and ground the corn and one thing or another. I don't know if, if Samson uh, uh, even talked to the Lord. I don't know. The Bible doesn't really say. He may have, he may have said, Lord, give me one more chance. I don't know. Uh, the Lord may have said, "What? What do you? What? What's? What's hitting your shoulders?" Oh, my hair, my hair! Wow. Uh, why don't you check that chain out? He started check that chain out, and they started giving away. And he said, "Oh, oh, maybe that. Maybe he knew that the power of the Holy Spirit had come back on him." The reason I'm suggesting this is because of what happens next. Now let's look here. And he, uh, and he uh, made them sport. He did. He let them humiliate him. He did what they asked him to. And they set him between the pillars. Verse 26, And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Uh, I'm tired, you know. I've been out here making sport. I just got off the grinding wheel. And, and so if you would just, I'm blind, but if you would just lead, uh, lead me up to those pillars on which the house standeth, that I can lean on them. Verse 27, Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, all five of them, and there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women, on the roof now, that beheld while Samson, uh, Samson made sport. Now, the, uh, uh, the situation is this. <laughs> I got an idea that Delilah was there in her new clothes. I bet you she was dressed out fit to kill. I bet she was there with those lords and with those Philistines. I bet she was there making as much fun of Samson as anybody else and so forth. And so Samson said, please let me lean against the pillars. Now Samson knew. He knew. Somewhere, somehow he knew that God's strength had come back on him. And I think that's the reason that he's had a conversation. He tested it out while he was grinding. It's kind of what I think. And Samson called upon the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O oh God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. His prayer was still about himself and his vengeance against the Philistine because they put out his eyes. Now you think about it a little bit. You go back over to, uh, to uh, uh, number six and you find the uh, Nazarite vow. And whenever you got defiled, you had to offer a ewe lamb and a male lamb and a ram and shave your head. 
then restart your Nazarite vow again. The former days didn't count. You start over again. So what had happened? God said, okay, Samson, you didn't offer a, 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 a female lamb and a male lamb. I took your wife and your father-in-law as a female lamb and as a male lamb. Okay, now there's two things left. Got to shave your head. Well, he told a lot of the secret, and he got his head shaved. So that's that was one of them. Now, the last one is the offering of the ram. And Samson himself became the ram. When he pulled that house down upon himself and, uh, and uh, slaughtered those Philistines. And Samson took hold, verse 29 says, of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up, and of the one with his right hand and the other with his left hand. And, uh, and Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which, were slew, which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Now, we look at this and we say, uh, wow, he slew more in his death than he did in his life. So, uh, how many it was in the upper tier? How many was in the second tier of that great Colosseum, but that's the way it was made? I don't know. Uh, but there, he slew more in his death than he slew in his life. Samson died under the rubble. And uh, he became the ram. God has his way. He wants to do his the way, uh, things his way. And we as God's people, man, we need to surrender to him and do things like God wants us to do them in our life. Verse 31 says, Then his brethren and all the house of his father came down and took him up and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtol in the burying place of Manoah his father. And so he, he didn't have a place to be buried, so they buried him just right next to his father. And he judged Israel 20 years. Again, it said he judged Israel 20 years, but he lived uh, more than 20 years. Uh, 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 he lived longer after he judged Israel than, uh, than uh, uh, the other judges. Other judges died, and then they said how long that they had judged Israel. Now, what kind of lessons do we get from this? What kind of lessons? Well, we found out that the Spirit left him and came back. We find out in the Old Testament that the Spirit came upon him and left and came back. We find that the Spirit came upon Saul and left and didn't come back. We find that the Spirit of God was in David and on David and could have left him whenever he, he uh, uh, had uh, uh, Uriah the Hittite killed and took Bathsheba as his wife. But God answered his prayer and, and did not take the Holy Spirit. Now then, in this day and age in which we live, when you get the Holy Spirit of God, he cannot be taken away from you. He will not leave you. Now, he can be grieved and he can be quenched. And his power can be diminished greatly. He can be pushed down to where he doesn't have a great lot of effect on your Christian life. But he's still there. He's still in you. He has sealed that new man until the day of redemption. He will never leave us nor forsake us. I, Jesus said, I'll send you another comfort. He'll abide with you forever. We do not lose the Holy Spirit of God. We do not lose our salvation. We will not lose our home in heaven. Do we sometimes uh, lose the uh, position that God wanted us to fill down here on this earth? Yep. Do sometimes we not fulfill totally the job that God wanted us to fulfill? Sometimes. Uh, can we come back and reestablish and ask God to use us and, and fulfill the job He wants us to do? I believe we can because God knows the end from the beginning. He knows everything about us. He knows our heart. He knows what we want to do. These are things that you've got to remember. Samson was a type of the carnal Christian. And 
We don't want to be carnal Christians. We want to be Christians that abide with God. When the Holy Spirit abides with you, you have fruit. Everything that we do that's good and right, it's done in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And everything that Samson did that was good and right as far as God was concerned against the Philistines was done under the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Every time. Every time. Now, what are the, some of the lessons that we can get from uh, Samson, the study of Samson? Number one, if a Christian doesn't bear fruit, he becomes a castaway himself as a branch. Sometimes uh, uh, he can even have uh, his uh, uh, life taken away where there's a certain uh, death or certain sin that a Christian can commit. That's a sin unto death according to John 5, 16. We find this, that a just man may fall seven times and arise and uh, again according to Proverbs 24, 16. And whenever you find the different defilements that Samson uh, had in his life, against the Nazarite vow, I think you find seven of them, and then he arose, and he brought down the uh, Colosseum upon himself and slew a number of the Philistines. Now, another thing you find out, Samson was, was not a spiritual man. He was a base man. And Paul said God had chosen the base things of this world to confound the wise. And uh, God has chosen uh, men that are sometimes base, uh, uh, to confound the mighty and to get his work done according to 1 Corinthians 1.27. And uh, we find also that uh, he who covers his sin shall not prosper, Proverbs 28.13. We found out that he who prays is stronger than he who mocks. They were mocking him and making fun. But he did say, God, give me back my strength. And his power was greater, prayer was greater than their mocking. And if you live according to, to uh, your lust, and uh, you'll die according to Romans 6, 8, 13 and Galatians 6, 8. So we, we want to live serving God. We want our affections to be set on things above. We want our desire to be what God wants them to be. And so as we study the uh, chapters that give us the life of Samson, we see that it parallels a Christian's life who lives for him or herself and is carnal and is not searching God's will for their life and walking in the steps that God gives us, the direction that God gives us. Let us bow our heads now and we'll have a word of prayer. Father, we know from the story of Samson's life that he was given a Nazarite vow. He was set apart for his life with a Nazarite vow. And whenever we got saved, well, we're sanctified and we're set apart as your sons and daughters for, for life. Never, never going to change. Then he was given a responsibility as a judge. And we were given a responsibility to reconcile the uh, uh, world to back to thee and back to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you gave us the word of reconciliation to do that with, the Bible. And you gave Samson, I know he had instructions on what to do from the uh, books, uh, uh, first five books of the Bible and, and the book of Job anyway, and maybe a, a lot of Joshua. And uh, he knew what was right. You'd given him the way to get it done. You've given us the word of, uh, of the, the uh, uh, word of reconciliation. And you've told us how to get our work done. You've given us the Holy Spirit living inside us to give us the power to do that. And Heavenly Father, you've given us a throne of grace that we can come to and bow our heads and praise thee for thy goodness and thy greatness and thy love and thy mercy and thy forgiveness. And we, we can come and confess our sin and know that they're cleansed and they're gone. Now, you, were, you paid for all our sins on Calvary's cross. Jesus did. Past, present, and future. But whenever we come, we confess unto thee our wrong. It restores our fellowship. And the Holy Spirit can come out of grieving or he can come out of being quenched and begin to work again in our lives. I pray that you'll bless every family that's been uh, met with us today now. Strengthen us and help us to glorify thee in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Amen. Well, his faithfulness really is great. And I'm thrilled that no matter what we face, God's faithfulness to us is there for all eternity. And what a wonderful thought is. Thank you, Tracy, for your willingness. It is hard to record and play or speak or sing to a camera. So we're excited for the ones that are willing to, to come and help. I've got a few quick announcements. First off, we sent out a letter this week. If you didn't get one, let me know because we're trying to make sure to reach every single member of our church and the ones that come that are what I call honorary members. And if you didn't get one, let me know. But we are already changing the week of camp again because the week of camp that we have sat on that paper got canceled by the camp director. And so they we got a different campsite to go to with a bunch of good fundamental churches. So I'm not going to give you the exact date yet because we're still trying to make sure it's established before we uh, send out another note saying when it is, when it gets changed again. We've had several frustrations trying to be able to go to camp. I don't blame anybody who cancels, but that's where we are with that. We usually do a fundraiser at the, the middle of to end of April for the teens to go to camp. We haven't been able to do that either. So just kind of letting you know what's going on as far as some of our, our ministries there. Ideally, we'll be able to meet again May 10th, Mother's Day, provided that everything continues to be the way it is. And this has been a, a lot of prayer and decision-making, wisdom, trying to gather as much wisdom as we can. So I pray for you to, I mean, I ask you to pray for us for wisdom, to know what to do and when to do it. And so we've got some guidelines we're already prepping on. We'll give you more announcements about that. But as of right now, our goal, if everything stays the same, is to open May 10th for services, and we'll give you some more precautionary uh, statements along that line, and just try to try to work with uh, the government as well as have wisdom and what to do back and forth. We also ask you to give if that's what the Lord's led in your heart to do. I know that God says to bring the tithes and offerings into his house, and that is a way that we show our love and devotion to him. And so if you've not given your offering, I encourage you to do one way or another. We have online giving. We also will receive it by check, by mail, or if you want to stop by and give it to us, or we'll come out and pick it up from you if that's what you'd like. We're just, I encourage you to give way less because we're trying to, you know, keep the lights on, so to speak, and way more because it's a way that we trust the Lord even through a hard and difficult time because he is faithful to us. And great is his faithfulness. And when we give, we say, Lord, we trust you, and we know that we can trust you because you are so wonderful and so faithful. Well, I ask Brother Bill to come and sing for us, and then after that we'll have a morning worship uh, message this morning. Life is easy when you're up on that mountain. And you've got peace of mind Like you've never known But when things change And you're down in the valley Don't lose faith for You are never alone for the God on the mountain, He's still God in the valley. When things go wrong, He'll make them right. And the God of the good time, He's still God in the bad time. The God of the day, He's still God in the night. We talk of faith when we're up on the mountain. All the talk comes so easy when life's at its best. But it's down in those valleys of trials and temptation. That's when your faith is really 
put to the test for the God on the mountain is still God in the valley when things go wrong he'll make them right and the God of the good time he's still God in the bad time the God of the day he's still God in the night Yes, the God of the day, He's still God of the night. Well, thank you for that special, Brother Bill. We appreciate your willingness to serve the Lord. It's difficult to sing or to preach or whatever to a camera. And I appreciate his willingness as well as Miss Tracy's willingness to come in and try to be a blessing to you today. And if it was a blessing, I'd encourage you to reach out to them sometime or when we do get to meet back again, ideally on the 10th again, uh, you let them know, hey, we, we appreciated your service to the Lord. It's a blessing to sing to the Lord and to, to play the piano for him or whatever. All we're doing is, is for the Lord. So. I asked you to just encourage them that way. It was encouragement and a blessing to me. Their Bibles will be in 1 Kings chapter 21. 1 Kings 21. We've been going through a life of Ahab. I'm not Ahab. Going through the life of Elijah. And Elijah's confrontation with Ahab was talked about. And we talked about how Elijah ran and, and he went the wrong place. He was just in such despair and just overwhelmed with depression, basically. For 40 days he went the wrong way. And God said, get up. Start serving me and do what's right. We talked about that last week. And then today's sermon, we're going to talk a little bit about Elijah, but mostly it's going to really talk about Naboth. I cut my sermon in half for the sake of time, and so we're not going to cover the second half too much. We'll mention it, but we're not going to get into the, as much of the sermon as I was originally planning. So if you have your Bibles, we'll be in 1 Kings chapter 21. It says this, And it came to pass with these things, that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near to my house, and I will give thee for a better vineyard than it. Or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And Ahab came to it, unto his house, heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he hath said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad? And why eatest thou no bread? And he said unto her, Because I spake to Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, And I will, will not give thee that my vineyard. And Jezebel his wife said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise, and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, and sealed them with his seal. And sent him letters to the elders and to the nobles that were in the city, dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote the letter, saying, Proclaim a fast, and set Naboth on high among the people, and set two men, sons of Belial, before him, to bear witness against him, saying, Thou dost blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out, and stone him, that he may die. And the men of the city, even the elders, the nobles who were in the inhabitants of the city, did as Jezebel had sent them sent unto them, and it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them. Let's pray and ask God's blessings upon this service and where we are this morning. Lord, again, we come before you just humbly bowing ourselves, saying how great and wonderful you are, and we're in your hands, and we are excited for whatever you might bring into our lives, Lord, because we know that you know what's best for us. We ask you to strengthen us and help us to learn something from your word today, and I ask you just... Um, Help, help us to just 
concentrate on you and, and remove all of our other distractions, Lord. We love you and we want to show it. In your name I pray. Amen. If you think about this, where Ahab is and what's going on, Ahab wants this garden that's real close to his palace. In reality, this is not Ahab's actual dwelling place, where he was, the Jezreelite, that city, compared to where Samaria was, where Ahab's palace was, is a good distance. It's almost like you would say it's like a summer home. And this is not the main thrust of the sermon, but it's, it's ironic to me how much Ahab had the amount of wealth that he had, and yet he still wanted something else. And when he didn't get his way, he, he was complaining and pouting and griping about it and wouldn't even eat bread. And, and Jezebel walks in and says, why are you acting this way? You're the king. Aren't, aren't you the king? Aren't you the one that's in charge? I'll get it for you. And she does this, uh, these letters, and she sends them. And they, they, if you read the rest of the chapter, you'll find out that they do exactly what Jezebel's told them, they proclaim this fast, they, they bring Naboth before everybody, an innocent man, and they stone him. And if you read over in 2 Kings, they actually not only kill him, but also his sons, so that there would be no one to take the inheritance of the city. And if, in tradition, but they had, if somebody did something wrong, like blasphemy the king or God, then the king was allowed to go in and buy their land after their execution was taken place. Otherwise, it was designed to give to the inheritance of the people. So this covers a lot more than just uh, the Naboth himself, but the, everything that she says to do spells out exactly how the king would be able to buy it, because typically he wouldn't be able to buy it and have it for his land, because God set up some, some verses in the Levitical law. We're going to find out how God set this in place, so that way the children and the great-grandchildren and the great-great-great-grandchildren eventually would still have the same inheritance. It was a special thing. We're going to get back to that in just a moment. But I think of all this being orchestrated, and I was preparing, and I thought about this, and I, I entitled my message, Murder, She Wrote, which obviously most of you would know was a, a TV series for years, and was very, I've only seen like one or two episodes, so many of you might know better, but I thought it was interesting because here Jezebel actually does the writing of the murder. It's, it's a writing that's going to take place for Naboth. And the whole thing behind it, you can see Jezebel's wickedness. But I think we can learn some lessons from this as we go into uh, the fact of where Ahab was and where Naboth was, I think we can learn some lessons specifically from Naboth. Uh, first off, Naboth was, was going to hold fast to doctrine. You see, those, um, if you're in Bibles, turn to Leviticus chapter 25. If you are just listening in your room, in your, in your room, wherever you are, front room, and you just want to follow along, that's fine too. But God set up some different laws to protect his people and to establish the, the ability for them to have an inheritance. And so over in Leviticus chapter 25, we're going to read a verse 25, verse 23. We're going to read a verse that talks specifically about this. And in Levitical law is a whole bunch of how you ought to act and how you ought not to act. So Leviticus chapter 25, verse 23 says this, The land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine, for ye are strangers and sojourners with me. Verse 24, and all the land of your possessions, ye shall grant a redemption for the land. So what they would say is, look, here's my land, and if I had to sell it because I was too poor, every 50 years there was a year of jubilee where you and, and somebody from the family could go back and buy that land so that it would be kept into the family. And God says, don't sell it. And if you do sell it, keep it, and so it's family. But never, ever sell it forever, which is what Ahab was asking. Turn your Bibles over to Numbers 36. Numbers 36. Just ex Leviticus. Numbers is the next one. Right after Leviticus. Numbers chapter 36. We're going to read verse 7 of Numbers 36. And here's the same basic proclamation uh, for letting them know exactly what's, what to do and what not to do. So 36 verse 7 says this, So shall not the inheritance of the children of Israel remove from tribe to tribe, for every one of the children of Israel shall keep himself to the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. Uh, and this is important for us to realize, because 
When Naboth says no to Ahab, he's not being belligerent. He's not being disrespectful. He's not being a jerk about it. Ahab offered a equal value, and quite frankly, in some ways, if you think I'll give you the a better garden, he a vineyard. He's he's offering something. Naboth had the ability to go in and barter. Say, oh, you want this palace? Okay, give me, you know, maybe twice the price of my vineyard. Or I'll take that one over there. It's, it would be easier to, 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 you know, gather in all the grapes and this and that. It's a nicer area. Or that place over there has a nice house, and so I'll take that place. He had a, a bargaining chip here with power because it's what Ahab wanted. But instead of giving up, what he knew, what he shouldn't give up because it's part of his inheritance, he chose to follow God and say, I'm sorry, I can't. God's commanded me otherwise. It'd be very easy for him to look at the lucrative side of things, like many other people would have, like there would have been at this point in time. How do we know? Because people were bending to the will of Jezebel and Ahab already. Because Jezebel writes these letters and tells them to lie. And they do. They submit to the king's authority that way. And the, the king's and Jezebel's because she wrote it in the king's name and sealed it with the king's seal. And for whatever reason, maybe fear of their own life, maybe because of their prominent statute they were in because of the king Ahab, we don't know. All we know is this. They were willing to compromise what would be right. They were willing to lie about someone knowing that it would lead to their death. And all those people were, were contributors to it. Not just the two men of Belial or, or Satan. Not just those two people that actually did the lying. But the elders that were a part of all of this and orchestrating it. They chose to let all of this happen so that Naboth would die. As I begin to think about it, I just think, man, Naboth was willing to defy the leadership in a biblical way. My friends, I, I do believe that we're going to get a reprieve from the situation we're in. I think it's coming, and I'm excited about it. But I also believe before too much longer, it's going to get much worse. And I, I'm not necessarily saying specifically with the coronavirus, although that's a possibility again. They're talking that maybe in the fall it's going to restart all back up again. I don't know. I don't know the future. I do know this. We ought to base every action that we do off of our doctrine, off of our beliefs that we have from God's word. What makes us different than other religions out there? This book. We believe this is God's word, and we ought to obey God rather than man. Now, God's word does com command us to, as much as possible, live within the, con uh, the, the government and to be good citizens. So God establishes the government, the kings and, and the rulers, the Bible says, and we ought to pray for them, the Bible says. And we ought to be the very best citizen we can be. We, we ought to do the best we can do. You know, God says, do all things without murmuring or disputing. And that's a verse we quote periodically and say. But if you read the rest of that section, it, says, it tells you why. And the reason is why is so that we can be light to the world because most people don't do that. Murmuring, disputing, complaining, and whining. It's so easy to complain and whine about so many things. So I, I believe from God's word that we ought to hold fast to God's word. And if there's a time when our government says to do something directly contrary to God's word, that we'd say, you know what? I understand what you're trying to say, but this is God's word, and I, I've got to follow it. I've got to put this before anything else in my life. God's word is something that we can live our lives by. 500 years before, Joshua and God had divided the land up. And Naboth's ancestors had received this plot of land. And God says, don't, don't sell it. Don't get rid of it. Generation after generation had been handed this vineyard. It was his duty to give it to the next generation. And you and I have a duty as well.
to give the biblical doctrines that we have to our next generation. Your children and your grandchildren need to know that you are willing to put your life on the line, if need be, for what you believe biblically, for what you know is true. They need to see that example. I hope someone said amen to that, because that's such an important thought. For you to do what you say you believe, and for your children and grandchildren and our generation after us that are currently living, will say, man, not only did my daddy, did my mommy, did my grandma, did my grandpa say they were a Christian, but they lived it even when it was hard. They put God's word first in their lives. One way you can do that is by simply reading it, letting it be a part of your life. You know, I think every child and grandchild should see at some point in time their mommy's and their daddy's Bible opened. Should ask a question, what you doing, mommy? What you doing, daddy? What you doing, grandma? What you doing, grandpa? Oh, I'm reading the Bible. I think they need to see that periodically. I think it's wonderful for them. Wonderful for them. Naboth, hold on to doctrine. Doctrine, as I'm using it in this word, is what the Bible teaches us to be true. It's what who we are. Without the Bible, we wouldn't be who we are. Without God's word, there would be no point. We wouldn't know who he is. We wouldn't, we wouldn't understand all of this. And I, I realize God gave us a conscience and God made creation. I understand those things. But if we didn't have the Bible to hold on to the truths of God's word, we wouldn't know so much of how to live. And God gives us his word so that we know what to do, how to act, be wise, the Bible says, be understanding of the things that God would just want us to know and do. And he lays it out for us so that we can have wisdom. And secondly, as we hold on to our doctrine, God's word, the truth in God's word, secondly, we also need to hold fast to our inheritance. And I'm not talking about something your mom or dad gave you in a physical realm. I'm talking spiritual here. So our inheritance is our, our birthright. You know, not everyone is a child of God. The Bible says over in First John one, I mean, in John one twelve though it says, "But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God." Our inheritance is not a plot of ground; it's much more than that. It's eternal life. It's the power to live right in this world. It's God's word manifest in us through the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ Almighty gave his life so that you and I could have our sins forgiven. What a thought that is alone. He died, was buried, and came back to life again. And he willingly accepts all who turn from their wickedness and say, Lord, I believe that I need you. I know I need you. And put God first. The Bible says that. Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. It's simple. The Bible says, unless you have childlike faith, the faith of just a little child, to come and say, everything that I need is in you, Lord. I can trust you completely. That's, that's what we need for salvation. And so here's, here's Naboth. He's not only holding on to doctrine, but he's holding on to his inheritance. He's holding on because the Bible tells him what he should do. God's word, num Numbers, Leviticus, those verses we read, he knows what he should do, and then he's holding it on because of the inheritance he's been given, and we need to realize the inheritance we've been given. Our birthright is not for sale like Jacob sold it. Uh, listen to Ahab's misunderstanding of everything. He says this, let me have your vineyard, or I'll give you a different vineyard somewhere. Oh, because this one's close to my, my palace, and if you don't want a different vineyard, then I'll give you the money for it if you prefer. I will pay whatever it's worth. Our beliefs don't come at a price. What we believe you can't buy. Think of it this way. The devil comes to offer all sorts of things in exchange for our inheritance, for what we understand that we obtain from God. And I'm not saying you can lose your salvation, because you can't. 
but you could make it so you don't act like you're a Christian of the Lord, of God, a Christian following God. Uh, what, what might Satan be offering you? See, he, he tempted Naboth to get rid of this incredible gift from God. Naboth got that because of an inheritance that God had given over 500 years before when they divided the land up. And Satan's asking him to compromise, give in. Take something else other than this. We'll give you a different garden or a different place. We'll, we'll buy it from you. Often, though, the, de the devil bargains with us. He says, it's harder to do what's right than it is to take the easy path over here. And sometimes it might seem that way. And even at the moment, it might be easier to take a different path. But in the long run, the easy path often is not the best path. And often what seems easy now ends up being the worst path way down, the harder path way down. It is easier to train a child when they're younger than it is to deal with rebellion when they're older. Now, granted, all children have their own ways and their own lives, and you could do whatever you want to train them properly here, and they still might end up in rebellion here. But always, always, it is e preventative is easier than corrective. It is easier to not drink alcohol the first time than it is to stop being a drunkard. And no one ever takes a sip of alcohol thinking, oh, I can't wait till the day I'm going to be an alcoholic and drunk all the time. It doesn't happen that way. Many people believe a lie that they'll be able to overcome it or, or not be able to be affected by it. But if you just don't drink alcohol the first time, that's much easier than it is to be way over here and suddenly stop drinking alcohol. And you can put this for any basic concept. It is much easier on this side, preventative, than it is corrective. And so here's Satan coming in, trying to tempt us to go down a path that we should not go down all the time. And it's much easier for us to take continually daily look after God and follow him than it is to be down this path that might seem easy at the beginning, but later on is suddenly very hard to be down. And suddenly you look back and think, how in the world did I ever get here? And you think, where, where, what steps do I need to do to get back to the right path? So here's Naboth, and he says, I'm going to establish this, this inheritance I have and hold on to it. Now, if you read the rest of the chapter, you'll find out Naboth dies. I already mentioned that. His children, his sons die too. And you would think, man, Pastor, you're saying hold on to doctrine, hold on to inheritance, and it brought him death. You're right, it did. Elijah comes on the scene, and Elijah goes to King Ahab and pronounces to King Ahab, you, my King Ahab, not my friend, you, King Ahab, did wrong, and God's going to judge you for it, and these things are going to happen. Here's how you're going to die. Here's how Jezebel's going to die, and God's going to bring these different things, and he pronounces judgment to Ahab, and that's where Elijah comes in on the scene because God knows what's going on. In fact, Ahab even calls him my enemy when he, he's walking through the vineyard and here comes Elijah, Elijah and Ahab says, oh, you're my, here comes my enemy. And Elijah says, this is the things you've done and this is the consequences for it. But we see such a small scale of things. And our minds are like, this can't happen. This is not right. This is not just. But God is just. And knowing that God is just gives us the knowledge that in heaven, Naboth's rewarded. That's kind of cliche-ish, but I want to say this also. You know how many people have spent millions and billions of dollars so that their name would be remembered beyond their life. I mean, people donate hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars to put a name on, you know, a 
a pew or they'll put their name on a football stadium or put their name somewhere so that, you know, name it a highway after themselves or a street. Why? So that people down the road will remember them. And Naboth has been remembered, the Bible says, for all eternity because God's word will remain forever. And Naboth was pinned into God's word in this book. And for thousands of years now, people have read his story and admired his integrity and his character. That he stood and did what was right, even when many other people around him were not. Even when it had been easier for him to not. And God rewarded him for it that way too. My friend, there are go is going to be days when we need to stand for what's right off of our doctrine and off the inheritance that God has given us through salvation. Even when other people around us don't. Even when it would be easier to not. Even at the sake of perhaps our own life. And God says, I am with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. On a commuter flight to Portland, Maine, in Boston, Henry Dempsey, the pilot, heard an unusual noise near the rear of the small aircraft. He turned the controls over to his co-pilot and went to the back to check. As he reached the tail section, the plane hit an air pocket, and Dempsey was tossed against the rear door. He quickly discovered the source of the mysterious noise, as the rear door had not been properly latched prior to takeoff, and the flew open, and he was immediately sucked out of the jet. After he was sucked out of the jet, the co-pilot realized this, and he radioed down to the station asking for a helicopter to try to find Dempsey because he saw him fly out of the plane. Knowing that most likely their efforts would be fruitless, but he had got permission to do an emergency landing and search for Dempsey. They landed the plane, and to their astonishment, they found Dempsey on the ladder of the plane. As he had been sucked out, he managed to grab a hold of that ladder and hold on for dear life for over 10 minutes, way up in the air. They literally had to help pry his hands off, his, off the ladder because of the whole, the grip that he had on that ladder for his life. And my friends, we ought to be like that. We ought to grip on and hold on for dear life to the principles that God's given us in his word, to God's word itself, and say, I will not relinquish, even for the sake of my own life, I'm going to hold on for, for whatever it takes. The gold rush of 1984 had people from all over the world headed to California with dollar signs in their eyes. Each person came with visions of finding a fortune, and many miners did indeed strike it rich. This phenomenon was all started by James Marshall, who discovered gold at Sutter's Creek. You would think that the man responsible for starting that gold craze would have died knee-deep in wealth. But ironically, Marshall died in the late 1880s as a penniless miner just a few hours from the place where he had struck gold. His fortune was never realized because he failed to stake his own claim. An individual can know all about God and the abundant life that he has to offer, but if you don't stake your claim by a lifelong commitment to Christ, you'll never experience the riches of eternal life that starts the moment salvation comes on. How true that is. God has riches beyond our wildest dreams. And I'm not talking about gold and silver. This is not a prosperity gospel. But Jesus being with you in every moment of your life. Take claim in the things that you know God's established for you. Hold on to his doctrine and follow him. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. And I, I ask you just let this be a way that would minister to our people this morning and help us to each step of the way. Hold on to what you've got for us in your word. Help us to, to study it like diamonds and gold and rupees, the Bible says, and just, just want to be a part of it. Help us to follow you. 
and all that we say and do. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, I trust our services were a blessing for you today, and I trust that you were able to grow a little closer to the Lord through what we talked about. I encourage you to listen again on Wednesday night. We'll have another message and a children's lesson. And if you've got kids sitting there at home today and they wanted a children's lesson, we have that recorded over on our kids' website. There's a link for that at the bottom of your screen as well. Usually depends on what type of uh, device you're using. On the left-hand side, there's also a spot where you can follow the children's lesson. And we just want to be a blessing and an encouragement to you and to your family. So if there's something we can do for you, you let us know. Today, I also wanted to make another announcement. Um, last week, we talked about Ethan presenting himself for a candidate for baptism. And my son, Jaron, come on up here, Jaron. Uh, he trusted the Lord as his Savior a few months ago, and he saw Ethan and found out about that. And we talked about what baptism is. What's baptism? It means you want to follow Jesus. That's right. It's an outward profession of what you believe inside has nothing to do with salvation, and you won't get your sins away by getting baptized. But what baptism is saying is, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I'm publicly letting everyone know that I want to follow him. And Jaron wanted to present himself as a candidate for baptism. And my family, I, I don't try to push any of those things. I let them, when they're ready, come and talk to me about it. So Jaron and Declan both have trusted Christ as their Savior, and Dec Jaron came to me and said he wanted to get baptized, and so ideally, when we get to meet back again, we'll probably do it, um, provided we get to meet May 10th, we'll probably do it the 17th of May, uh, baptizing Jaron and Ethan both. So we're excited for them, and we're excited for what the Lord's got for their future. If you are glad for that decision, they have you say amen at your house. Hope you did. Anyway, if you have any questions about that, Feel free to call us and we'll see you on Wednesday. Goodbye.